Welcome to the Exam Study Expert Podcast, helping you ace your exams at school and university through the psychology of high performance and the science of studying smarter, not harder. It's my pleasure to introduce your host, the Cambridge-trained memory psychologist and exam success coach, William Wadsworth. Hello and welcome to the Exam Study Expert podcast. Let me introduce today's episode by sharing some of the questions I most commonly get asked about in my line of work. How to get motivated to study. How to overcome distractions when studying. How to save time and increase your productivity, i.e. get more done each day. How to manage exam nerves. How to increase your memory recall. These questions together represent some of the most common issues that come up in my work as a study strategy coach, uh, working as I do with clients to help them pass their upcoming exams. Uh, And they also are the sort of questions that often come up when I'm working in schools or universities, running workshops with students to help them prepare for their exams. Now, each of those questions, motivation, focus, memory, is is a huge topic in its own right. Um, And the be a lot I'd want to say on each one of those questions. Uh, Today's episode is about one single, almost magically powerful factor that can go a surprisingly long way to helping you unlock progress uh, on all of those questions. That factor is where you choose to study. And to give you an idea of personally how powerful I found this principle uh, in my own life, I honestly think uh, I owe my degree, uh, getting my degree uh, and the the grade I got in my degree, a first class degree from Cambridge, um, to environment where I studied more than any other single factor, except perhaps my learning strategy, flashcards in my case. Uh, And even then, it's quite a close run thing between those two factors and how important they were uh, in getting me my overall degree grade. The strategy I used to learn, as I say, flashcards, and then where I chose to study. So where you choose to study can be a really powerful factor in your overall Uh, study strategy and how you perform overall. I today want to unpack six major considerations, uh, which I think you might want to think about when it comes to uh, selecting a study space, shining a light on how potentially powerful this decision could be, and hopefully giving you a few ideas for how you can use this factor, uh, location, environment, to help you study smarter, get more done, and ultimately ace your exams and assignments. Let's take a look. So I'm going to spend quite a lot of time unpacking the first of these six factors. Uh, This one on its own will probably be about as much as the other five put together because I've got quite a bit I want to say on it. Uh, This one is compartmentalisation and your motivation to study. So we're incredibly receptive to environmental cues, what's around us in terms of what we can see, hear, even smell. All of this can put us in a totally different state. And if you don't believe me, Let me demonstrate. So if you're in a place where it's safe to close your eyes, as you're listening to this right now, uh, you might want to close your eyes for this quick exercise, just the next uh, minute or so. Obviously, if you are driving or otherwise not able to safely close your eyes, then obviously please don't uh, close them, Uh, keep them open. So let's take just a moment to settle in, take a couple of breaths if you wish. And firstly, I want to imagine yourself, picture yourself in your mind's eye, walking down a tropical beach. The water is a deep turquoise and glitters in the light of the setting sun. Waves lap the shore. A gentle breeze rustles the palm leaves. You feel the smooth white sand between your toes as you stroll. And the gentle touch of the sun on your skin in the evening light. Now, noting how you feel at this point, let's go somewhere else. You step out into a massive university library, and it's just a few days before final exam season begins. All around you, perhaps 200 other students sit hunched over their books. It's completely silent in the sense that no one is talking, 
it's not allowed under rules of the library. But you nevertheless hear the murmuring of a hundred laptop keyboards typing away rapidly and of scratching pens and shuffling pages. If you've closed your eyes, uh, you can open them again. Uh, how did those two places make you feel? Um, notice I didn't put any emotional language into either situation. I didn't tell you that you felt relaxed on the beach or that perhaps you felt the urge to sit and work when you were in the library. Uh, but if you were engaging with the exercise, you might well have felt those emotions of relaxation or, or, or sort of focus or, or possibly even a little bit of stress came up with the library one. Um, you know, your mind knew to respond to the cues about the sights and the sounds and what you're seeing and hearing, uh, even without actually being in that place. That's the power of environmental cues. Imagine how powerful it is to actually be in those places and not just to imagine them. So in effect, we can train our mind to respond differently to different kinds of environments. I therefore suggest where you can to try and use compartmentalization to lean into this uh, principle and make it easier over time to focus. So if you can, try and keep a space that's dedicated to studying. That's the only thing you do when you're in that space. And that will help your brain over time learn that when you're in that spot, that room, that place, wherever it is, that is time to study. You'll sit down in that place and just by being there, your brain will start to click right into study mode. Not necessarily right from the start, but as you train it up over time, uh, that will start to come. To take a brief counterexample, absolutely don't study on your bed. That's the complete opposite of what we're trying to do with this strategy. Uh, if you study on your bed, then you're getting the cues all mixed up. Uh, your brain will think it's time to sleep when you're trying to study. And frustratingly, when it's time to sleep rather than study, you might struggle to switch off from worrying about your exams. And so you end up with the worst of both worlds. You're sluggish when you try to study and then you can't sleep when you want to. Um, it's not a great idea. And um, so that's a kind of extreme example of what we're of kind of the opposite of what we're aiming for. So uh, we'll try and aim for compartmentalization, try and keep somewhere dedicated that's just for studying, either a dedicated room that you or space that you go to, or even if it's not practical to switch to a totally different place or room. You might consider trying to keep dedicated zones in your room uh, for work versus relaxation versus sleep. So even if you're, you know, taking a quick study break, 10, five, 10 minute break and, and, and doing something, uh, you know, non-study related, try and move away from the spot that you do your studying in, even just scooching your chair over a few feet or pointing it a different way or just kind of sitting on the floor for a few moments. Uh, it, anything to kind of get yourself just a little bit removed from that spot that is precious just for just for studying that you want to kind of maximize those those environmental cues that, you know, when you're in that spot, it's study time. Uh, and similarly, if you are a, a visiting a library or other space to study, perhaps consider not taking your lit breaks in the library itself. Actually get up and leave the spot you study at um, when it's time to have a little breather uh, in order to keep that association as strong as possible between the environment you're in, that, that kind of library space that you're in, and the behaviour that you want to encourage when you're in that environment, namely studying. The second factor I wanted to talk about is uh, keeping a clean, distraction-free surrounding where you can. So one of the other benefits of getting out of the house into a library or other space, if you are able to do so, is that you also leave behind many of the distractions and temptations of your home environment. Not too many libraries come equipped with TVs or games consoles or fridges full of food and all those other things that might tempt us to abandon our study sessions early. You could even choose to leave your phone at home when going out on such a study session. I know that might sound, might sound unthinkable to some of you, uh, but just imagine how much more focused and productive you could be as a result. Finally, getting out of the house could also be good for avoiding the human distractions. Your siblings, your parents, or for older scholars listening, uh, your spouse, partner, or, or even your children. The third factor is about social nudges and your motivation to stay on task. So I was talking just now about how other humans can be a source of distraction and how by getting out of the house into a different space, you are able to, to potentially reduce those kind of external distractions and make it a little bit easier to concentrate. Other people can be uh, a, a motivator, a, a source of motivation as well as distraction, though. So particularly if those other humans around you have their heads down and are working intently, that can be really helpful to you as a strong social nudge that that is what you want to do, too. You want to be head down and working as well. 
We humans, uh, by and large, are deeply social beings and we have strong instincts to do as we see others do in order to fit in and avoid being cast out by the herd. And we can harness this positive peer pressure to help us stay focused and productive in our study sessions. If you're anything like me, you might find that if you go to a place where everyone around you is beavering away, even if you kind of didn't feel much like beavering away before you walked in, you, you kind of basically can't help it once you sat down. Everyone else is doing it. And so you feel a bit uncomfortable if you, you know, just sit there slacking off or, uh, you know, swiping TikToks on your phone. So that helps you get into study mode. You're basically looking for a space with others around you working quietly. This could be a library reading room or maybe a dedicated study space set aside at school or college. I've even known some students go to their parents' place of work. Or if it's really not feasible to get out of the house, you might think about, um, you know, if you have the option of doing this in your if, in your house where you live, you know, maybe leaving your, your bedroom and studying perhaps at the table downstairs. You know, perhaps that could be a good option. Um, and, you know, I talked earlier about how other humans could be a source of distraction. Well, again, even those other humans could be uh, a, a source of motivation and, and just having that occasional uh, parent or partner floating around, um, um, you know, the, the, not what be your 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 desire not to be seen to to be slacking off and to be getting on with their work your work, you know that just might be a little nudge in the right direction to keep you on task. A final idea which uh, came up in the uh, recent productivity hacks episode we did uh, just before Christmas uh, is to uh, use the world of study with me videos. So you know even if all the options I've talked about aren't an op- uh, aren't available to you, you can't go out of the, your room, um, then try a video where you see other people working away. So there's loads of study with me videos on YouTube, you know, flip one of those on uh, and that will kind of act as as the next best thing to actually being in a physical space with other people studying there. You know, you'll be able to virtually see someone else studying there and that will act as in the same kind of way to nudge you to get on with your studies as well. And I think the test, uh, the popularity of these kinds of videos is testament to the power of this uh, little trick. Okay, so the fourth factor I wanted to talk about is preparing your mindset for the exam hall. So the kinds of spaces I was talking about a moment ago, kind of libraries, study rooms and so on, those kinds of places where you've got lots of other people around you studying intently, those might not only be a good boost of your productivity, uh, those kind of useful social nudges to keep you on task I was talking about just now, those kinds of spaces may also have a valuable role in helping acclimatise you to exam hall-like environments. Now, I'd know a few people who strongly disliked working in more intimidating environments of this nature. Uh, I'd say, you know, fine, okay, that's not your preferred space. Okay, so don't go there, perhaps at least most of the time. But what I would say is that if you ultimately need to take your exam in a space that has dozens or even hundreds of other students around you working away intently, that's what the actual exam will be like. I do think it's important that you get used to working in a space that feels like that in advance and just learn to be just a little bit more comfortable. You don't have to go there always, but I think mixing in a little bit of exposure to that kind of environment even if, perhaps especially if it makes you feel a bit uncomfortable, is a really good idea. We're probably not setting out with the aim to be totally relaxed in that kind of space. It's always going to feel a little bit intimidating, and that's okay. But we're just looking for at least some exposure, um, taking the edge off that discomfort so that it doesn't totally put us off our stride when we get into that exam hall. A little caveat to all of this, if an exam hall environment makes it particularly hard for you to work, uh, perhaps because of uh, some kind of anxiety condition or maybe a sort of sensory sensitivity, you could ask, consider asking for alternative accommodations somewhere else to take your exam. Uh, and we talked about this just last week, episode 140 with Dr. Matt Zakreski uh, on considering different kinds of exam accommodations that might help you on exam day. Factor number five is context-dependent memory to maximise your recall. This is a fun one. Studying for at least some of the time in a space that we've sort of space we've been talking about, the kind of intimidating space with lots of others around working silently, a sort of space that feels like an exam hall. This trick could even facilitate your ability to recall what you've learned when you get into the exam. It could even be a learning and memory benefit as well. So this is all about uh, the relatively well-established body of research on the effect we call context-dependent memory in psychology. 
And this is one of the effects I talked about back in episode 87 when we did five fun memory effects. Um, in short, context-dependent memory refers to the finding that if you, the environment in which you learn something is more similar to the environment in which you recall something, recall will be facilitated. So in other words, make the place you learn and the place you have to recall similar and it makes it easier to recall when you're doing the recollecting, the remembering. Now, remember that we're talking about a little bit better. We're not saying that this is kind of a, a kind of magic bullet and is going to transform your memory overnight. So, you know, don't start sneaking into the exam hall at the weekend and reading all your books in there and expecting to remember every single word perfectly when you take the exam. We're talking about a sort of marginal improvement in recall, uh, relatively modest in the grand scheme of things. But in an exam, my general philosophy is that we want to find every potential improvement for you that we possibly can, big or small, um, especially when, as in the case of the question of where to do your work it doesn't actually take you any more time you know you still have to do the work anyway so by doing it in a different space if you can get a memory benefit even a tiny one then that's worth having i think I'll throw in a comment uh, at this point for those who don't have anything to learn and later recall. So maybe your study goals aren't a final exam, but you're working on an assignment or project or, or research uh, dissertation of some kind. In that case, you might want to think about what space is most conducive to you doing your best work on that kind of uh, project or assignment. So, for example, uh, for kind of creative projects, innovation and so forth, some people find they can't beat the that sort of creative buzz of the coffee shop to get their creative juices flowing, for instance. So finally, in at number six, we have locating for convenience and potential time savings. So finally, a few practical considerations. This one is about thinking through the potential time cost or savings, uh, time savings uh, in terms of where you choose to study and how long it takes you to access various things that you need to access as part of your study day. So if you're optimising for convenience, your dream study location might have some or all of the following depending on your needs. Access to amenities, so no 20 minute trek to the bathroom or to refill a water bottle somewhere to buy food or at least to eat food that you have brought with you uh, if you are settling in for more than a few hours of studying and will need uh, refreshment throughout the day. Somewhere to plug in and charge up if you need a laptop to work. Access to books and journals for your course as will be provided by a library if you need such things. Somewhere nice to take a break Maybe an open space outside, a nearby park or garden or grassy patch uh, where you can take uh, a little bit of fresh air, maybe a short stroll after your lunch. And ideally, the commute itself isn't too onerous. It doesn't take you half the day to travel there and back. Now, the, remember, these are just a few considerations. You might have to compromise on some of these things in order to get yourself to that premium, low distraction, ultra focused study environment that sends your productivity through the roof. The above aren't must-haves, they're just factors to consider. So there are my six main considerations. Hopefully I've given you a sense of the potential power of choosing your study space in terms of factors like compartmentalization and your motivation to study uh, through those positive environmental cues. And particularly if you can always study, uh, always only study in the place you choose to study, your brain learns to associate that being in that place with it being time to study. In terms of avoiding distractions, in terms of perhaps using others to positively nudge you, that positive peer pressure to help you stay on task, in terms of preparing your mindset for the exam hall, in terms of context dependent memory to maximise your recall, and in potential, in, and in terms of uh, locating for convenience and potential time savings in not having to trek uh, for hours to get uh, books or journals that you need, for example. At the start of this episode, I talked about the power of my study space. So what was this magical space? For me, it was the Plum Auditorium at Christ's College, Cambridge. I've mentioned it in a 
previous episode or two, I think. Um, so it may be familiar to long time listeners. Um, for me, this was the perfect space. It was big, full of desks, totally silent, very intense, studious atmosphere, zero distractions. And more than that, a very real feeling that you'd be adversely judged if you were doing anything other than getting your head down and getting on with your work. Playtime is over when you're in the plum. And that was exactly the atmosphere I needed. Lots of that lovely positive peer pressure to have really intense, focused study sessions. And it also felt just like an exam hall, so probably helped with that exam hall mindset and context-dependent recall stuff I was talking about. There was even a nice breakout room next door to have a breather, uh, which I usually did for a few minutes at the top of the hour, uh, and it was a convenient five-minute walk back across college to get lunch. The Plum Auditorium wasn't all of my friends' preferred options, uh, but honestly, it couldn't have been the more perfect choice for me. Motivation wasn't my problem. I was highly motivated, but even then I found that I just got far more done each day in the plum than anywhere else. I got going earlier, I procrastinated less, my breaks were shorter, and I just worked with more intensity when I was actually sitting down and working. I still ate well, had loads of time to sleep at night, uh, and took time off at various points for rest and recreation through the week, so I still had that balance, um, but the plum was key to me hitting maximum study productivity gear uh, for the few weeks leading up to the big year-end exams each year uh, at university. One little story I wanted to share uh, to illustrate just how powerful this was for me. Uh, and I don't think I've ever admitted this story to anyone, even friends and family. I don't think anybody knows I've, I've done this. So I'm, I'm here sharing it with you all now. Um, but in my last year at university, uh, the final exams for my course were much earlier than everyone else's. Mine were right at the start of exam term. Uh, and then we spent the rest of exam term on when everyone else was doing their exams on a research project. So I was uh, a couple of weeks out from taking my exams at the start of exam term and the Plum Auditorium was only due to open as a study space like a day or two before my exams and I wanted to use it earlier. I wanted to use it sooner because I was <laughs> had early exams to prepare for. Uh, so I wrote to my college senior tutor to ask if we could open it early and to the college's credit, they obliged. However, that meant that I was uh, stuck in a big empty space just by myself uh, because no one else knew it was open. Uh, and a major part of the value was that space being filled with other students working quietly. It was the people that created that intense atmosphere that I found so conducive to concentration. And so, um, and it makes me chuckle to, to sort of admit this, I made posters advertising that the Plum Auditorium was open for study and I put them up around the entrance to the college library a guerrilla marketing campaign, <laughs> if you like, to get uh, other students into the Plum Auditorium, uh, where I you know, wanted to be around other people working. Uh, and it worked. Sure enough, a few students started coming along and we were in business. So what is the right location for you? I've talked a lot about a lot of considerations. Uh, let me leave you with one final thought to wrap this episode, because I'm conscious uh, a lot of my examples were kind of about libraries, uh, study spaces at college or school. Uh, that's great if you either have access to a library in your town or some kind of space at your school or university you can go to. Uh, but I did just want to speak to uh, the, the sort of professionals studying for exams. Uh, that's a kind of key listener group. And many of you have been great coaching clients for me over the years. Um, and, you know, conversations I have with, with, with you guys often, you know, include the sort of practical limitations that, you know, even if there is a library near you, the opening hours don't work for when you need it, you know, early before work or in the evenings. So when I'm talking to professionals about options uh, for the best place to study, it usually comes down to a choice of home, work, or what I call the third space. So just to briefly mention uh, my thoughts on this, uh, home is often the kind of default option. Uh, it can work well, but some people find it hard to be productive there because that is the space they associate with rest and relaxation. You know, as soon as you get home in the evening, uh, it can be a little bit hard to rev your brain back up into work mode. Or you can simply get swept up in family life and it's hard to concentrate. So the second option is studying at your workplace. Sometimes the office or workplace is a good space for getting your head down, um, perhaps especially outside of normal working hours when you have the place to yourself if you get in early. Or perhaps you can book a meeting room or similar where you can work quietly. Or maybe go down to the empty lunch canteen after hours in the evening. But if neither work nor home are good options for you for whatever reason, then we need to explore the third space options, as I call them, uh, perhaps a coffee shop that you pass on your commute. Uh, and often this turns out to be quite a good option for people. So if you're not sure what's the best option for you, my best advice is 
try the different options and see what you like. Try the coffee shop on the way into work. Try the uh, meeting room after work and experiment and see where you have your most productive study sessions. And whether you're a professional studying for exams as part of your career trajectory or a student facing major exams as part of your school or university education, I want to close out this episode with a reminder that help is always on hand. When I'm not out and about in a school or university running t- uh, study skills workshops, uh, my main work is coaching private individuals uh, such as yourself, helping you plan your perfect study routine, refining your learning strategy to help you learn faster and remember more, and ultimately helping you ace your exams the smart way. To learn more and book an introductory chat, head to examstudyexperts.com forward slash coaching. It would be my pleasure to meet and see how I might be able to help you get the results you're looking for in your upcoming exams more easily. That's examstudyexperts.com forward slash coaching. Thanks to you all for listening today. Uh, And one final thought, if you're listening to this on a platform that gives you the option to leave a comment on this episode, uh, as Spotify does now, why not take a moment to answer the question in the comments, where do you study best? And that's a wrap for today. Please do tune in again next week when I'll be talking to Dr. Frank Buck, who literally has a PhD in time management about some of his top tips for staying organised and keeping on top of your tasks and saving you time each week. Some real gems, like literally some, one of his things just made me go, oh my gosh, that is genius. Um, so it's it's a really good episode. I think it'll be well worth your time. Uh, I really look forward to sharing it with you next week. In the meantime, thanks so much again for listening today and wishing you every success, as always, in your studies. If you've got exams coming up, you can now get all of William's favourite tips and tricks to save you time and get you higher grades, all in one handy cheat sheet. Grab your copy at examstudyexpert.com slash free tips. Thanks again for listening and see you soon.